Joining me now, Sam Bankman-Fried, CEO and co-founder of FTX. Sam, great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Of course. Thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. This will be a longer conversation, so I'm excited to get your thoughts on the market and the growth of FTX. But let's start there. FTX has seen explosive growth since 2019 when the company was founded. $32 billion valuation. Your company is now worth more than Twitter and some of the biggest banks in the world. Can you give us a sense of the scale and, and the global user base of FTX? Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting. And, you know, one of, I, I think, my favorite statistics that, that sort of says something about who we've been as a company um, is if you compare us to at least sort of the public numbers that Coinbase has, has revealed, we have um, something like, you know, three times the daily trading volume uh, that, that Coinbase has, uh, but they have about 30 times the number of registered users as we do. And so when, when you think about, you know, FTX's user base and growth so far, um, it's predominantly been, uh, you know, growth in uh, really high volume users, the sort of power users that feel like really strongly about the product that they're using. That has been, you know, by far the biggest source historically. Um, and, uh, you know, much more so than sort of, you know, the long tail of retail users uh, that, 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 you know, I, I think it powered um, part of the space, but you know that's where we've been been strongest, and, and I think that that has a lot to do with where we came from as a company, which was thinking about uh, you know how do we build a product that's powerful and robust, and, and that sort of like addresses a lot of the weaker points of the industry, and, and I think it's something that not enough players have really been been aiming for. Yeah, and, and that's good context too. You started your career on Wall Street. Does that have anything to do with building out an institutional platform uh, for maybe high frequency traders, hedge funds, a little bit of more complex trading instruments? I think it definitely does. And, and I think that, you know, one way that we thought about the platform when we were building it was, you know, how can we combine sort of the better elements of crypto platforms with the better elements of traditional financial uh, platforms, you know, and, and I think that like, Thinking about what are some of those, well, when you look at, at crypto platforms, I think one of the really beautiful parts of them um, is that they are really uh, direct platforms that everyone has equitable access to. Um, you compare that to what happens when you buy a stock as, as an average consumer, and you know, you're probably going through like 10 different intermediaries by the time you actually do that trade. It's a, a very messy process. Um, and, uh, and, and I think what that means is that like, it's, um, uh, it, it's just sort of, um, it's not the, the sort of process where as a typical consumer, you can get, uh, really equitable access to it. You know, you each, each step along the way, they're sort of removing market data and adding fees by the time it gets to sort of whatever mobile app you're probably using, you don't get to see the market you're trading in. Uh, at all. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, you compare that to crypto where everyone has direct access to the order book for the matching engine in exactly the same way. Um, I, I think it, it, it makes a lot more sense from a market structure point of view. So that that's one example of like a place where we actually decided that the way that the cryptocurrency industry had evolved sort of was the way that made sense. Um, a, a sort of counterpoint to that is when you look at risk engines, especially, you know, a few years ago when, when we were starting up FTX, um, you know, the standard in crypto for some reason was that every single platform um, was using these really, really uh, split margin systems where every pair that you traded had a different margin calculation. You had to separately collateralize your Ethereum futures, your Bitcoin futures, your XRP spot, your XRP spot against Tether, um, you had to be constantly moving between the hundreds of different wallets that you had. Um, it was it was a real mess, and uh, and and it made it very difficult, practically speaking, um, to uh, you know manage that unless you had an automated system that was sort of like doing collateral transfers for you, which is not a thing that you should have to do. And and, and so that was an example where the sort of standard cross margin model that most platforms. Using traditional finance, we thought was the better model and the model that 
you know, crypto should be using as well. And, and, and so, you know, we cross margin everything on FTX. Got it. Are you, is that, uh, does that differ from what a Coinbase or a crypto.com does? Does that stand out in terms of FTX's model? It does. And, and well, you know, it, it certainly stands out compared to almost all of the other derivatives platforms. You know, you look at, I mean, Coinbase has been basically entirely spot markets without margin and without futures. So from their perspective, they, they don't even exactly have a risk engine um, that, that sort of is operational. Um, uh, and, and, and I think the same thing generally with, uh, you know, crypto.com is primarily a spot uh, and from a primarily sort of a retail mobile app type platform. Uh, but if you compare it to, you know, to Binance, to Huobi, to Opay, to BitMEX, to, to the other sort of players that were, were major players in the sort of, you know, derivative space in crypto, uh, you know, especially circa, you know, 2018, when, when we started building FTX, it, it's very different from how all of them work. Got it. And I do want to ask you about derivatives. We've seen a big rise in whether it's Bitcoin futures, Ether futures, other derivatives. What are you seeing on FTX in terms of who's using leverage in these markets? And is that a healthy amount or are there pockets of the market that may be taking on too much risk? Yeah. So overall, I think we've seen the amount of risk in the system become much more reasonable over time. I think that, you know, you, you rewind a few years to March 2020 um, and, and, you know, there's a big market crash. And during that market crash, something really interesting happened, um, which was interesting in, in a bad way in this case, um, which was that basically um, I, markets got out of control on their crash. And, and, and it got to the point where I, you actually like couldn't, I, you know, find bids for, for anything like there's, you know, sell. And what do you mean by out of control? Is that on um, leverage? Was that too much risk? It, right. What you mean by out of control? So what it was, was that people had too much like leverage on specifically being long relative to the amount of capital that was in the space. And so first of all, there's massive liquidations that were sort of causing cascades and, you know, as the sell side liquidations happened, they drove markets down and, and triggered more sell side liquidations. At the same time, as I think there are too many people taking too much leverage, um, uh, there wasn't enough capital in the space to backstop the bids. And so as you had sort of this downward spiral unfolding, there is no capital that was sort of coming in and, and you know, buying during this sort of periods of, of large liquidations in the way that I think would be sort of like economically efficient to do. Um, instead, things just kept falling and, uh, you know, Bitcoin was down more than 50% on, on a single day at one point. Um, that's very different from what we see today. Today, we see a much healthier space um, where, I mean, first of all, people are just taking less leverage, um, which is a big part of it. Um, but second of all, like in addition to using less leverage, um, there's more institutional capital in the space the larger players have more capital. And so that means that during volatile markets, liquidity doesn't dry up nearly as much. And I think a combination of those two things together has been really impactful. And what was going on at FTX during that time? I'm sure that as a CEO of an exchange where there is a lot of leverage, uh, how did you guys remedy what was going on in the markets? I know you changed the amount of leverage uh, last year that people could take. It was at 1.100 to one. Did you have to make any steps or any changes as CEO? Yeah, I mean, I think that we did have to change some things. And, you know, we had to uh, review our, our, our margin parameters and make sure that they were able to handle, you know, the level of liquidations. We've been, you know, constantly refining the algorithm and, and the technology as well and making sure that, you know, when things get really busy, volumes go way up as well as volatility. And we need to be able to handle that on the matching engine side. And so that's been a piece of it too. Um, but the other thing I, I think, um, you know, we, we did reduce the maximum leverage, but the truth is that on FTX, people were not never taking that much leverage. Um, it wasn't the platform that people were going to, to put on, you know, hundred uh, X leverage positions ever. I, I think BitMEX much more so was, and, and, you know, had that reputation. And I think had built out uh, some of that as, you know, how it had operated as an exchange on FTX. It's almost always been the case that, you know, very few people have been taking more than than three to five X leverage. Um, and, you know, the average leverage on the exchange is about two X. And so it's it's never been the platform with 
it, that sort of itself has had really unstable amounts of leverage. Got it. I want to step back and just ask about your revenue model and how FTX makes money. Can you walk us through how you guys make money and how trading volume plays into that? Yeah. So, you know, basic model is, is pretty straightforward, um, which is, you know, we have, I, uh, I, uh, you know, we, we, we have volume that trades on the exchange. So about $15 billion a day on it, on sort of an average day to day. Um, and I, you know, we take a percentage of transaction fees. Um, that, that percentage is on average um, somewhere around two basis points, so 2% of a percent. Um, and so if you want to estimate, you know, FTX's revenue, you actually get really close if you just do that, that sort of simple math. If you just say like, well, uh, you know, what is, um, uh, you know, what is like two basis points of $15 billion a day, it gets you about 3 million. And that is, in fact, roughly our, uh, our, our daily, you know, revenue. And, and so it's a pretty straightforward um, revenue model. Um, and, uh, and, and in particular, this looks a little bit different than what you see for more retail facing exchanges. Um, you know, exchanges that are sort of like heaviest in facing like um, long tail retail customers tend to charge much higher fees on those. Um, you know, I think like 3% is, is the average fee that, that I think like Coinbase and some others charge on their mobile app. Um, and so, and so their, their whole revenue model is very much skewed towards like, I, uh, you know, 3% of, of, of a few hundred million dollars a day of volume rather than you know, we are our two basis points blended average fee rate. And, and that, that really does get you kind of the bulk of, of how to think about our revenue. Got it. Got it. Well, for the, the broader industry, we've seen this really play out in the traditional brokerage industry, fee compression in the industry going to zero. We think of Robinhood yep. as sort of the forefront of that. Uh, what effect could that have in the industry? Do you expect more competition and margins to compress at some point? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely do expect margin compression. I would be somewhat surprised if there wasn't significant amounts of margin compression, frankly. Um, and I, you know, I think that we've already started to see some of it. I, I, I think that we're going to see a lot more. Um, I actually weirdly think Robinhood's fees have never been as high uh, in crypto as some other retail platforms have. And, and so I think that like, I would expect some compression on their part, but I don't think they're going to be sort of the biggest place of compression. Um, but I do think there will be a number of places that, that will have really significant um, revenue compression. And, uh, and, and I think that'll, you know, that'll have real impact on, on, on the industry. Um, you know, I'm guessing that, uh, that we'll see that play out sort of over the next five years. I don't think it's going to be super fast though. And, and I think that's maybe one way that I, I think I disagree with some interpretations at least of it is, is that, is that I think like some of the sort of like takes you'll see, I think envision like fee compression happening over the next year. Um, the place where there's this fee compression, it, it's sort of in like users who aren't spending a whole lot of time and attention thinking about crypto trading. And so those are users who, uh, you know, aren't going to be, uh, the most fee sensitive. They're not going to notice as much when fees are really high. Um, and, and, and I think that means that like, it, it might take a while for that economic pressure and that competitive pressure to, to really take place. Like these are just people who are not really actively comparing fees across platforms. So I think it's going to be a year's time scale thing, not a month's time scale thing to see that fee compression. But I, I think fees like 3%, you're just not going to see in a few years. It, it's, just, it's just insane. It, it's way too high. Like at that point, it's just hard to find like brokerages or similar platforms where 3% is a reasonable number to be charging. And, and I think like you're going to see things converging a lot more to the sorts of levels that, that I think we already have on FTX where like two basis points is sort of our, our, our blended average. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. It's a question that we get a ton in, in terms of people who are used to free trading on the equity side might get into crypto and wonder about some of the fee structures. So really interesting. Yeah to get your take there. Um, I want to ask you about Bitcoin. I mean, we've seen the price now around 38,000. It's been a, a tough year for cryptocurrencies. Uh, does that factor into your top line and is a slowdown in Bitcoin prices bad for your business? So, I mean, I think the first answer is just 
absolutely. Like it does factor into our, 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 our revenue. And, um, you know, in general, I, I think thinking of, of, you know, volume is proportional to price is like a decent first order approximation. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think that like that drawdown does have impact. It's worth noting that there's also been more volatility, which is, um, push a little bit in the other direction, you know, right now, I think our, our sort of like 2022 run rate so far has been slightly higher than our 2021 average, uh, you know, p &L was. Um, so, so I think things have still been trending slightly up, um, but, but I think a lot less growth than we otherwise would have seen. One thing which I think is like relevant to note here, though, is that this is not really a crypto specific move. Um, and, and that's different from some previous times when we have seen crypto acting pretty idiosyncratically. Um, if you look over the last few months, equities are down a lot. Um, and, and I think it's been sort of a, a, a two, um, you know, two major factors. The first and the biggest by far is monetary policy. Um, you know, there are now significant expectations that because of inflation, um, you know, the Fed is going to uh, start to take up interest rates. And, and, and that's going to have, you know, probably pretty big impact um, on, uh, on, on, on what we see, like, I, I think on the margin, you know, that's, that's just going to be decreasing balance sheets. Um, it's going to be like less buy pressure. It's going to be, you know, effectively, de you know, cause, you know, like curbing inflation in the US dollar. And, um, and, and so I think that's one piece of this um, that, that I expect to be real. Um, and I think the market is pricing quite a bit. And I think that's, that's led to a, a big drawdown in crypto. I think it's also led to a big drawdown in equities, especially the sort of growth tech equities that had been growing a ton during COVID. Um, the second thing, uh, which is more recent, is just the Ukraine situation, uh, which I think has, has put a lot of fear into markets. Um, I think it's not obvious what the long-term impact of that is going to be on crypto. I, I, I think that, that in particular, you, you could make an argument for why this increases the demand for crypto. Right. Well, that's that's one thing I can't wrap my head around. We talk about Bitcoin as apolitical, free from government intervention, and it feels like the bull case really is that it's not a macro asset and it shouldn't trade like equities because it's sort right. of separate. How come that's not playing out yet? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I don't I don't know the answer, but here here's my best guess. Like if I had to take a stab at it. Um we're still short time scales here, right? Like, I mean, not super short, but it, it's been, you know, a week, basically, of like really significant sort of Russia Ukraine news. Um, on that time scale, like, a lot of people won't have yet made their trades, right? Like, if, if, if sort of a big hedge fund is thinking about getting involved in crypto because of this, they probably still haven't signed up for an account. Um, what we see right now is sort of the initial reaction of markets. And the thing about the initial market reaction is it's uh, been trained over the last year um, to anticipate really strong positive correlations between equities and, and crypto. And I think the reason is basically because the thing that's been driving both equities and crypto um, has been monetary policy, right? It's been uh, expectations of inflation. And... Uh, or, you know, changing and, and fluctuating expectations of inflation, to the extent that that's what's driving markets, like that you should find positive correlations um, between crypto and, and equities, that, that's sort of an easy, efficient thing to happen. Um, and that has been happening. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that what that means is that, like, the market has just come to expect pretty strongly that, crypto and, and equities are positively correlated, then you see, you know, the S&P 500 move down on, on Ukraine news. I think there's a lot of bots that just like automatically assume crypto should move down. And, and you see like that correlation, I'm not sure how deeply thought out it is. I don't, right. and that's not to say it's necessarily wrong. And I do think there's real information in that being what happened. Like, I, I don't want to dismiss that as a data point, but I also don't think it's like the most deeply considered data point ever. So you think it's a lot of automatic selling and buying? I think that's right. And I think that a lot of people, like, let's say that you're a quantitative trading firm, right? And, and you're, you're particularly like a heavily automated one, not like one with a lot of manual intervention. And, and many of these are heavily automated. Many of these are effectively black box trading systems, right? You've run some studies which are informing what models you think 
you should be using. And your studies show a strong positive correlation between crypto and equities, right? You're just going to be running trading systems that assume that. that. That would be the natural thing for you to be doing there. Even if in this particular case, it actually doesn't make sense. Like even if in this particular case, in fact, maybe you should be expecting a negative correlation. I'm not sure you should, but it, it wouldn't be crazy to think so. I, I Like you won't have yet retrained your models. Like you won't be like, oh, there's like one new day in which like the correlation looks slightly lower than normal, like time to throw out, you know, a year's worth of data. So yeah. You just have a lot of market participants that, that I think probably have not thought deeply about whether they should be changing their models. And can Bitcoin break away from that correlation if that's the case? If you've got these traders that are really, like you said, a black box, they've got their model and they buy and sell based on some of those macro factors, can yep. Bitcoin get away from that? I mean, is that a, a barrier to Bitcoin decoupling from equity markets? It's a barrier, but it's not a strong barrier. Like it's this kind of thing where like what you sort of expect to happen is imagine that half of all market participants just look at historical data and the other half are sort of like thinking just about macro and and and, and economic fundamentals. The the first half is still assuming a you know eighty percent correlation between crypto and equities. The second half now thinks zero correlation or like isn't even sure what direction the correlation should be in. Right at the beginning, you're still going to see a very positive correlation because you have two parties, one of which is running a very positive correlation and the other which is running zero. But it might be less positive. You you might see the correlation start to drop to like. 60%. Um, and then what you'd expect to happen after that is the people running historical studies will update their models, right? And they'll be like, oh, interesting. Like, seems like the correlation is decreasing, right? And so their models will have like, start modeling lower correlation. And, uh, and then the empirical correlation will go down because their models are having impact on what happens in the world. And, and you might actually get kind of a snowball where slowly sort of the, the observed beta in the market, the observed behavior exponentially basically decays down to sort of like the new fundamental economic expectations over time. I'm not saying that's like exactly what's going to happen, but that's like one model you could have whereby like on a time scale of maybe like six months or so, um, things would update to being more in line with what, uh, you know, with, with sort of like macro thought and less in line with with sort of like stale historical models. Got it. Okay, really interesting. It's great to get your perspective on that. And I think there's a lot of people just curious to really what's getting in the way of another Bitcoin bull market. Is there anything else you mentioned the macro factors and some of this automatic trading that needs to happen before there can be another step function higher for cryptocurrencies? I don't think there's anything that needs to happen. Um, but I think there are some things that would help quite a bit. Um, and by far the biggest thing here is, is regulation, and in particular, the U.S. regulatory environment. Like, if you look at the largest trading institutions, um, what are they waiting for? You know, what are banks waiting for to get involved? I think it's basically entirely clarity on the regulatory side, right? These are institutions which are used to assuming that whatever fees happen, they're going to get the biggest and the first. And, you know, they're going to have the most regulatory scrutiny on them. And they want to be confident that they understand a system before going in perfectly. And so even just sort of like some amount of uncertainty in the regulatory environment is enough to scare them and make them feel not super comfortable getting involved. And I, I think that's a lot of what's going on right now is just like a number of, of institutional players are, are feeling nervous and, and are sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what happens. Um, but would like to get involved and, and will get involved if they feel like they can do so in, in a, a safe way. And, and I think that's going to happen. I think it'll take time, but I think it'll happen. And so, uh, you know, I, I sort of expect that like over the next year or two, there's going to be enough clarity that more institutions will come in, but it, it's going to be a trickle. It's not going to be a deluge. You're not all going to come at once. It's going to be a long process for them, uh, but 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 I do think that like regulatory um, pathways are, are probably the other biggest barrier to adoption right now. And and again, I'm I'm optimistic that that that's going to get better. Yeah, well, you've spent some time on Capitol Hill. I know you've, you've yep. uh, appeared before some congressional committees. 
and testified in front of Congress. Um, there are a bunch of different initiatives and focuses. You've got stable coins, a Bitcoin ETF, uh, spot markets. What seems to be the most urgent from Washington, and what do you think will get the most attention and most clarity in this year? Yeah, I mean, it's a little all over the place, and I think different departments and agencies are really are approaching this from meaningfully different perspectives. Um, my sense is that the first thing, or one of the first things to move, is probably going to be stable coins, just because I think it's the easiest. Um, I think that, like, when you look at the stable coin regulatory framework, right, the goal there, I think, is pretty clear and straightforward which is like have audits that confirm the backing of, uh, of, of you know, stable coins, confirm that they are backed as they say they are. Um, and I think just that alone solves for a lot of what people want. Um, and and, and, and it, it doesn't get in the way of sort of legitimate goals of the industry, um, but it, it, it really helps give comfort to users. It helps give comfort to regulators. Um, it helps protect, uh, you know, consumers and, and just solve for like, a large number of things that, 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 that I think are in demand right now. So that's the first thing that I expect to happen. Um, and, uh, or at least I, I sort of like expect that to be one of the first and sort of think that that's something that may come over the next um, year. There are already some bills being introduced in Congress, which I think are completely reasonable and would be good, good approaches for how to handle this. So that, that, that I think is sort of going to be step one here. Um, Probably, and, and again, I'm 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 excited and optimistic for that. I think that's going to be good. Um, you know, after that, um, I think you get to trickier things, um, and, and I think there's sort of like two other topics that that are sort of like really central to the industry. One of them is looking at um, uh, you know, basically looking at the markets regulation piece, at, at who has oversight of spot markets, who ensures that you know there's no market manipulation who licenses it um and that has not had a ton of clarity um because basically you know the united states is two different market core markets regulators the cftc and the sec um and you know the cftc market is a market regulator for commodity futures the sec for securities um it's actually interestingly unclear what the answer is for spot commodities they sort of fall a little bit in between those two. Um, and that's been a big source, frankly, of, of uh, tension and, and lack of clarity going forward um, is, is like, what do you do in a world where um, I, where there, there's two plausible regulators? You know, I think in some senses, two regulators can be worse than one regulator because you can get a too many cooks in the kitchen type, type situation. Um, and, I, and I think we've seen some of that, um, but I, you know, I, I think that on that front, like there are really concrete pathways, I think, to make progress there. And so, so I, I do sort of think progress likely will be made, um, but, uh, but that's been, uh, you know, a big holdup for the industry. Um, uh, you know, my guess is that you're going to see the CFTC expanding more into the spot commodity space for digital assets. I think it's a really natural extension of their current regulatory jurisdiction. Um, the, the, the last piece of this is on the token registration side, you know, sort of the equivalent of securities registration um, of, you know, what you do when you go public um, in order to kind of give all of the disclosures and have the oversight necessary for consumers to, to be able to access your equity. And, and, and that's something where um, I, you know, I, I think that, there, there exists a process for, for equities. I think it is the right general, like it, the same principles apply in many cases to crypto, but, but it's not literally exactly the same thing that makes sense. Like there's just a lot of small differences. Um, and I, I think like working that out and coming up with a, a clear framework for digital asset registration is sort of the last you know, missing piece here. Got it. Well, very much a global asset and FTX is set up in NASA, you've got uh, offices and um, just sections of the business. You've got your U.S. section, your global business. Where do you think the crypto capital of the world is right now? If the U.S. is figuring out regulation, is there a place where you think 
the majority of crypto companies will redomicile or look to move if they can't get the clarity they need in the U.S. You know, interestingly, I don't think it's totally clear. You know, I don't think we're in a situation where the answer is like, oh, yeah, you know, like it, it, it's country X, like that's where everyone is. And, and I think that there's been a lot of changes in people's expectations around this over time. I think that like there is a time when Singapore looked like it was going to be the crypto capital is probably time when Hong Kong looked like it was going to be um, Switzerland, Malta. Um, and, and right now it's a little bit distributed, like all of those countries and more have some stake to it. I think that the Bahamas is, is, is probably like my best current guess. Obviously, I'm biased on that. Um, but it's one of the only countries that has an actually comprehensive framework um, for you know licensing and regulating uh, digital assets and, and digital asset businesses. And that's just worth an enormous amount. And, and so I, I think that like um, that's been a huge driver of more of the industry um, looking into or getting set up in, in the Bahamas. Um, I, I sort of expect by default that that trend would continue. Um, although, you know, obviously we'll see what happens. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that like, it's probably going to become like at least one of the crypto capitals and, and you know, and, and it might be, for instance, the like non us Western crypto capital might, right. might end up being sort of like where the Bahamas ends up that, that would be, a, I think a, a totally unsurprising outcome to me. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that I expect the U.S. to sort of like make a rebound in its sort of like stake in the industry over the next, I, uh, you know, say few years, because I do think that there's a lot of demand for the industry in the U.S. And, and, I, and I do think that the, the frameworks are going to get to a place where people feel more comfortable transacting there than they have historically. Right. And, and still leading the world on the venture capital side. It seems like the majority of startups yes. um, are still based here. I, I do want to ask you about what's going on in Canada with, as it relates to crypto. We've seen truckers protesting yep. COVID-19 restrictions resulting in uh, some in some instances having their bank accounts frozen. In some cases, their crypto wallets frozen. As a global company, does that worry you, the idea of governments freezing accounts? So it's, you know, on the one hand, it's a thing that there has to be a pathway for. Um, because of, you know, illicit finance, because of, of, of you know, uh, countering terrorist uh, activities and financing. Um, and so, you know, the answer can't be that, like, there is no regulatory oversight of this or anything like that. Um, on the other hand, I do think it, 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 it's really important um, for that to be used really judiciously and, 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 and thoughtfully and appropriately by, by governments. Um, I think that, like, it's quite bad if you end up in a world where um i uh, people lose faith in, in sort of government's ability to police that appropriately um i i think that like you know we're going to see a lot of interesting discussions coming out from a lot of places right now i, I think like you know eastern europe is probably going to be another one right like I, I mean there's discussions of sanctions on uh on russia right now it's not clear exactly what that means but um it wouldn't be surprising, right, if that ended up meaning um, that there was pressure to, uh, uh, you know, to to uh, potentially offboard some set of users. It, I don't, I don't, I don't think we know what set yet. Like this, this is all sort of like hypothetical and unclear. But um, I, but but I think that's going to be like an increasingly interesting and 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 I think like tense question over time where I don't know, yeah, I don't, I don't want to pretend to know where everything will end up. Um, but like my guess, if I had to guess, um, would be that um, I, we're going to see a lot of hard decisions made. We're going to see a lot of second guessing of them. We're going to see a lot of back and forth between industry and regulators on this. Um, I, I think that like, you know, the, uh, in the end, I think what's important is that, like, you know, you're never going to know what the right decision is for sure, but it's really important that everyone be on board that reasonable decisions are being made. Um, I, and, 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 you know, have, have faith that the system is working reasonably in, in this. And I think losing that faith is, is really, really expensive. Um, 
I, I think that like this is something that regulators are generally aware of. I mean, it's not you know regulating uh, for illicit finance is not a new concept um, to them. But I uh, I uh, but it, but I do think it's one that that we're going to get a lot more detailed look into. Uh, I, I think a thing I will say w which has been interesting, and I think non obvious from the outside is like our uh, you know my sense has been that our, our sort of conversations. Um, and interactions with, um, uh, with you know, Homeland Security, DOJ, you know, Secret Service, other FBI, other agencies that are looking into, you know, terrorism, fi terrorist financing, illicit finance, and and generally like, um, uh, you know, flagged transactions, have been really positive and productive, and and, and I think that's given. All a lot of the the chatter that you hear about the industry, I don't think that's something you'd necessarily predict would be true. But it, but I do think that it really has been true that they've been like productive, constructive discussions. Like we're able to take action really quickly. We're able to be helpful in tracking down what's happened. And I, and on our, on our hand, and you know, we felt like when whenever we've been reached out to directly by law enforcement, I think we felt like like you know like the US law enforcement has been acting pretty reasonably and responsibly in that and 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 been pretty pretty happy uh to help and, and to support that. So so overall and and again I don't want to make too strong of an of a sort of like an absolute statement here. But like overall I think our interactions with like US um uh you know law enforcement on this have been like fairly positive. Right. And well and we saw the FBI launch its own crypto unit and it seems like in some instances Bitcoin is actually more traceable and probably more helpful to law enforcement than cash, which has been the argument by a lot, a lot of advocates of the industry. I think that's sort of right. And I think there's a little bit of a pattern where like criminals will like choose to use Bitcoin because it's sort of like what you're told you're supposed to use to launder <laughs> funds. And then they'll like get caught and, and sort of like, I, I think, I think maybe in retrospect, sometimes regret having done it. Um, and uh you know, is what I must imagine is happening because yeah, it is like actually pretty traceable. And, you know, we've helped trace a lot of this. I mean, I think like one of the highest profile cases of ransomware in the last, you know, decade um, is one where like the funds hit FTX, we immediately froze them and returned them to law enforcement. And so I, I think that there are a lot of useful you tools. This, by the way, would you see illicit finance going on on the platform and call the regulators or is it the other way around? It, it completely depends on, on how the association is made. So the big question here, right, is like, how is it determined that someone or some transfer or some address or something is illicit? And sometimes the answer is that this comes... Uh, from law enforcement reaching out and saying, hey, this person is not on any sanctions lists. Like you're not gonna find anything about them. But like off the record, like we are doing an investigation and, and are aware that this is the person who like is responsible for for something. And, and that just like isn't public yet. So there's no way for us to know that it's illicit, but, but law enforcement will reach out and alert us. Other times an address will already be flagged because it, it will already generally be known that um i you know that like some uh some party has been involved in in, in in you know illicit finance and and when that happens like we will immediately uh reach out uh, about that and and immediately freeze the assets because we know what's going on and i think like you know one good example of that right it's like you look at the the bitfinex hack that was recently recovered right like why they have so much trouble getting any money out of that like they got basically nothing from it you know yeah. the answer is that like if they ever sent any of those coins to ftx like we know which coins those were you know those are immediately getting frozen it sounds harder than you might think to launder <laughs> cryptocurrency. yeah i think uh, that's right <laughs> well i want to pivot to uh blockchain gaming this is fascinating and we could talk about the cybersecurity stuff all day but uh i know ftx launched something called basically crypto as a service and uh, for yep. blockchain gaming. Break us down for that. What's the long-term value of video games built on blockchain and how does that fit into FTX's business model? Totally. So, you know, first of all, what is what is sort of the, the vision here for, for the industry? Um, I, I think that like there are a lot of reasons that it makes sense for some video game assets to be tokenized. 
right? You know, skins and cosmetic uh, items in video games, they're already basically NFTs, um, just not called that yet. And what you get for making them actually NFTs, you have a profile that you can display to the world that you can take with you. That isn't tied just to your, um, you know, one game or one account. You could have cross game things. You could have an asset that appears in multiple games. And in fact, any game could pitch into that. You know, if, if you wanted to, to build some world that, you know, take some game, right? Whatever, maybe League of Legends or something introduces, uh, you know, StarCraft and introduces, um, you know, NFT skins. And then you're building a game that you want to also respect people's StarCraft skins. If they're NFTs, you can do that because you have them hook up their wallet that has those skins in them. Um, it makes them transferable and, and marketable assets as well. Um, and, uh, and and so I think that that's sort of like, is a lot of where the vision for for this is sort of in, in theory coming from. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I basically think it's pretty exciting. Um, the, uh, you know, other things like general interactivity between online universes, right? Like you can have, Everything from like one video game, another video game, your social media, you know, news and everything else, they can draw on each other. They can all reference the same ledgers, right? You can have an in-game chat, which is the same as your out-of-game chat, or at least is interoperable with it. Um, breaking down these sort of like mono monopolistic barriers between social networks, um, you know, and, and you can start to build a real sense of what is your online avatar portfolio and, and sort of like self. Um, right. based on sort of the collection of, of the assets that, 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 that you have. So that's, I think, sort of like the vision for this. And then, you know, what role do we want to play in it? I, I mean, you know, we'll see, but I, I think the most obvious one um, is that we have all of the backend infrastructure yep. necessary for that, right? We have an NFT platform, um, but we also, in addition to that, have, you know, wallets, deposits, withdrawals. Um, you know, it's a, a full stack crypto venue. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and so, you know, we can support all, of, you know, funding with fiat currencies, funding with cryptocurrencies, um, on chain, off chain, cross chain, like we, we have all of that built out because we need to have it for FTX. And it's really easy for us then to just put an API around it and let video games draw on that exact same tech stack that we use internally. What about big tech? I mean, you mentioned interoperability and the idea of transferring NFTs to different platforms. Would that be the case if a company like Meta is really the one building the infrastructure yeah, yeah, yeah. of its own metaverse? Yeah. And what do you think big tech's role should be here? Uh, should be or will be. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think my sense is like, what will it be? I don't know. What should it be? What would be, I be excited for? I think interoperability is just a big win-win for the world, right? Like it's really dumb right now that if you're using Facebook and I'm using Twitter, we can't talk to each other, right? Like that, Facebook, will Facebook ever do that? Will they want to, to work with Twitter or FTX in this case? It's unclear, right? And now you get to like, well, if you look at big tech, what are their incentives? Like they might be happy with the current semi-monopolistic, like high barrier to entry system with giant network effects. And, and so that, that gives me sort of, that's why I have pause on like, what I think will happen. Um, but here's a vision for how this could turn out well. And I'm not, I don't want to promise it will, but here's how it could. Um, you imagine that like um, uh, a, a world where somehow the status quo is sort of broken, where somehow you end up with a blockchain-based social media system that lots of platforms can draw on, right? Now, all of a sudden, the network effect becomes powerful because that's where all the messages are stored. And if you don't use it, you can't draw on all people's existing connections um, and, and messages. Um, and so that can start to become um, that same network effect. But unlike current social media, it's a network effect that isn't exclusive to one platform. It's a network effect that anyone can access and draw on. Um, and uh, and that anyone can build their own portal to access. And I think that's really awesome um, and, and really powerful. And it's a, a way to, to sort of have incentives set up such that um, if you can get in that situation, maybe it's sustainable, right? Maybe once you're in that situation, everyone's going to want to interoperate 
with it because that's where all the activity is, is happening. So, so I think there's, there's a big activation energy that you have to get over to get to that world. But if you can do that, I think it might be sustainable. Got it. Well, definitely an area to watch. And we'll let you go soon. But I do want to ask you about uh, plans for FTX as a public company. Is that something on the roadmap? And do any of the public comparisons, whether it's Coinbase, Block, the high growth tech stocks we mentioned earlier, they have really underperformed the market lately. Does that give you pause about eventually being a public company and needing to deal with the share price? Well, it absolutely gives pause. And I think it's less about the long term because we knew that like markets go up, they go down. But, but I think short to medium term, it's certainly a big factor um, and, and certainly makes us like less excited than we otherwise would be to, to, to be public. But, but I think it's also, you know, we're in a situation where we don't have to go public, fortunately. Um, and, and I think that means we don't feel super incentivized to right now. Like it's not the right environment for it. Um, and, um, and, you know, we're, we're net profitable. Like we don't need to do it to get cash. And, and so I think we sort of feel like, yeah, you know, like we'll keep reevaluating this and see if there's a time where it makes sense, but there doesn't have to be a time when it makes sense. If the answer is that we never go public, that's okay with us. Um, and, and so, you know, we'll, we'll just place dynamically. Got it. Well, a lot of interest around an eventual FTX IPO. So keep us posted. Sam, yep. thank you so much for being here. Really interesting conversation from market structure to blockchain gaming. Uh, we'll have you back soon, but appreciate your time. Sam Bankman-Fried, CEO and co-founder of FTX.